Thank you very much. Uh, this is only the first of my 60 slides. Uh, no, it was a joke. I was trying to wake you up, actually. Um, science, the endless frontier. I thought it was appropriate because I think uh, you probably can understand what a frontier is. And uh, this is a famous sentence. This is uh, the title of a report that uh, President Roosevelt commissioned to Professor Vannevar Bush many, many years ago uh, to basically make a study to understand how the mobilization of the science and technology community realized during uh, the Second World War could be put to use to society. The result of the report was basically the birth of the National Science Foundation and the creation of the modern system of funding research from public governments. Everything was in this report. It's a fascinating reading. And it's basically many of the motivations are still valid today. One could actually lift some of the words to be used in any documents today. Um, this document also shaped uh, the way in which research and innovation was organized along very traditional disciplines. And increasingly, this kind of division is now coming under pressure. And the main problem is that universities have departments, but society has problems. And problems do not map over university departments' boundaries very easily. And so what is happening is that the traditional reductionist model that science uses, you take a big problem, you throw away everything that you don't think is relevant, and you come up with something really simple, doesn't work very well, because now we have uh, to consider messy, multidimensional problems that are difficult to treat, difficult to reduce, sometimes difficult to understand. On top of that, we have emergence of new technologies that are basically empowering very different fields. Information technology is the main examples, but there are other cases. In, in summary, the pressure against the traditional disciplinary barriers is increasing. In fact, they're crumbling, but the academic community is often very slow to understand the process. And we, we really need to think something new. And uh, something new has been um, in the works for a while, but has been written very clearly in a paper uh, published this year by the MIT. I realize it's a little strange to quote MIT at the Harvard Club, but um, they did this work. It's a good work. And uh, they introduced the concept of convergence. Convergence is when disciplines break completely out of their bounds and they become something else. This is happening very fast in genetics and information theory. It's becoming something different, that bioinformatics is happening in science and engineering that increasingly are becoming closer and closer. And what this shows how arbitrary, in a way artificial, these boundaries are. My claim is that climate change is a converging science. Climate change is actually a science that is in the middle of this process of convergence because we need a host of expertises from different fields in order to be able to address the real problems. That is not the problem of the meteorologists or the economists or their particular problem. The problem are the challenges that come from society, from the public, in order to understand what will happen, what it will mean in one word, what it will mean for the life of everybody. This is the problem, and that cannot be mapped over university departments. So climate change is a laboratory of convergence. And we are not totally ready to it. Uh, we are uh, creating problems, as I said, that are very messy. We don't know the solution. Uh, mitigation, adaptation are familiar concepts. But adaptation has lots of uh, limitations. I mean, if uh, Holland goes underwater, uh, we can assume that the Dutch cows will adapt but I don't guarantee about the cheese after this, actually. Uh, this lesson was uh, somewhat received in Italy, and uh, we have established the Euro-Mediterranean Center for Climate Change. And this center was uh, basically thought as an integrating center that would serve as a reference point for all climate change impacts modeling and uh, estimation. The center is based on uh, uh, six divisions. 
The basic idea here is that we go through the entire vertical chain of the climate change problem. So we go from the numerical experimentation, the scenario, to the impacts analysis and modeling and agriculture, cost, co um, costs, marine. And then we go into the economic and social impacts through economic modeling and other, and other approaches. And then we also try to develop now a climate service that will serve as an interface in order to make usable all this information and knowledge that is being created in a way that it can be um, included into informing policy, into planning infrastructures, in general, into, into all kinds of applications. And uh, we do, just I'll show you a kind, some examples of the kind of uh, what we mean by convergence. We have a lot, we're doing uh, a lot of work on the ocean. We're actually running a global uh, forecasting system for the ocean that is based on our experience in the Mediterranean where we're running a forecasting system for the Mediterranean that is used for application for emergency, security, marine operations, and offshore operations. And this is a, a piece of our model, this is the, our global model uh, that we use for the, our experimental forecasting operations. And these are very important for marine operation at sea because it will give you a way of making them more efficient and more secure. Uh, just an example of another integrating pro project. This is a project that was done in uh, Montenegro in the Adriatic Sea. But in this case, we integrated different models from a river basin model down to a coastal area model, urban waters, underground waters. All of this is part of the same system that allows us to make an a evaluation of the impact of climate change. And we have to pull together all sorts of different expertises to get these people simply to talk to each other. That was quite interesting. And this is a further example of the chain of modeling that allows us to go down to 50 meters from the ocean down to 50 meters into the river to be able to model the entire uh, hydrographic basin. We're also running a seasonal forecasting system. This is highly experimental, it's global. Uh, you cannot read this slide, but it doesn't matter. This is the technical explanation. But it will be more interesting, this one. This is also an uh, unreadable slide, but what it means is uh, seasonal forecasting is a difficult problem. Where it's red, we have some skill, some hope of actually doing it. Interestingly, the skill is mostly in the tropics and over South America, and so we think that this is also a very uh, promising field of investigation and application. Uh, finally, just to show you some results from our economic models. These are the results from an economic model that is trying to assess the impact of climate change in the case of no action. So this is the impact of the global GDP in the case nobody does anything. And if you probably, I can point, I cannot point, but uh, the uh, red line in the middle is the impact on the world GDP is about uh, um, alpha point of the world GDP in 2050, something like that. So this gives us a volume of the problem. A point, you know, the world GDP is about $60 trillion. So half a point is about $300 billion. That's the cost of climate change if we don't do anything. So this is the size of the problem. And the models can go very in detail. This case was done for the Mediterranean. So we have a lot of different uh, uh, countries. But it's a global model that represents the global economy. And this uses an input the climate models, the climate scenarios that we have produced internally. So we are putting this community to talk together. And this is some of the issues that uh, we're discussing for our Italy-Brazil cooperation. This is basically um, uh, summing up the thing that I've, that I've said, so I will, I will not go through them. And I think that we really have an opportunity of uh, starting a very fruitful and interesting co uh, cooperation. Uh, we realize that uh, Brazil is str strategic for a number of reasons. It's also strategic from a meteorological point of view. The tropics are the engine of the earth. And so we have to understand what is happening over there in order to understand what the climate does. So it's a very selfish interest, you might say. Thank you very much.